for coming. Uh, we're going to get started. So, uh, I'll just make a quick announcement uh, about how we're going to proceed. And just so everyone knows, there's restrooms in the back here, or you can go to the bathroom floor uh, if you need to. Um, and then there's food in the back, obviously. So, uh, we're going to have, the format's going to be, we're going to have two presenters and then a quick break, and then another presenter and a quick break, and then uh, Dr. Kutrafella will present, and then we'll have sort of Q&A afterwards. Uh, so, and then just to say something quickly about the scope of the papers, um, it's not, we didn't want to do like a traditional author meets critic kind of thing. Um, where everyone grills Andrew on the book, um, but more so think, thinking in terms of all the different things that the presenter's own work kind of could touch upon in relation to Andrew's book. So there's a nice kind of array of, of topics and issues in all of the papers. Um, and yeah, I don't think anything else. So uh, we have Cameron Coates uh, is going to start us off. Uh, it's a former grad student from Loyola, and now it's Paul. And uh, yeah, so we'll let you go first, right? Yeah. Um, well, before I begin, let me just say what a pleasure it is to be back here at Loyola and uh, see so many familiar faces. Um, and let me thank uh, Carlo as well for putting in a lot of work to make this possible, and uh, and to thank Andrew as well for writing such an interesting and, and thought-provoking work. It's really an honor to be back here at uh, be a part of celebrating that. Um, so I wanted to start with just a question here, which is, uh, why is Hamlet so long? At about 4,000 lines in the conflated text, Hamlet is the longest of Shakespeare's plays. More than 1,400 of these uh, lines belong to Prince Hamlet, making his role the longest of any character in a single Shakespeare play by hundreds of lines. Contemporary productions rarely stage the play uncut, and it is unlikely that it was ever acted in full, even in Shakespeare's day. Kenneth Branagh's 1996 film version of an uncut Hamlet uh, is more than four hours long. In 1899, English actor-manager Frank Benson put on a full-text production of the play in London. It was dubbed the Eternity Version, and was apparently better known for its excessive length than for Benson's portrayal of the prince. It started at 3.30 in the afternoon and lasted to 11 o'clock at night uh, with an hour and a half interlude for dinner. In a recent book by that modern uh, bardolator par excellence, Harold Bloom, Bloom wistfully wishes that the play were even longer than it is so that we could spend more time with the prince and hear even more of his innermost thoughts. Reading Bloom, who is even more of a Hamlet idolater than he is a bardolator, one sometimes gets the sense that he wishes the play were actually a poem unlimited, a real eternity version, and that he would love nothing more than to hear Hamlet soliloquize ad infinitum. While not everyone may share Bloom's effusive enthusiasm for the melancholy Dane, Bloom hits upon a genuine Hamletian sentiment in wishing the prince had more time. Despite the extraordinary variety of Hamlet's meditations, which seem to encompass all the ethical, political, theological, cosmological, ontological, and psychosexual dimensions of his own being and of the world at large. By the end, Hamlet still feels he has not had enough time to tell us everything he wishes. In the final moments of the play, amidst a stage littered with corpses, a poisoned Hamlet addresses the audience directly. Quote, You that look pale and tremble at this chance, that are but mutes or audience to this act. Had I but time, as this fell sergeant death is strict in his arrest, oh, I could tell you, but let it be." End quote. Had I but time, what else could Hamlet tell us if he had time? How much more time would he need? Would any amount of time be sufficient? Hamlet's wish for more time may not surprise us, given that all he seems to do in the play is make time. One perennial question of the past 300 years or so of Hamlet scholarship has been why Hamlet makes so much time and seems to do so little with it. The moment Hamlet learns from his father's ghost that he was murdered, Hamlet seems eager to play the dutiful son and avid avenger. Quote, 
Haste me to know it, that I with wings as swift as meditation or the thoughts of love may sweep to my revenge, end quote. Of course, Hamlet anything but sweeps to his revenge. Not for another 3,000 lines and three hours playtime will this blood payment be exacted. And even when it is, we wonder if Hamlet would have done it were it not for Claudius and Laertes' bungled ploys. The interim between is Hamlet's, and it has plagued critics to explain why Hamlet delays his revenge for so long. Some have suggested that external circumstances prevent Hamlet from immediately killing Claudius, that Claudius is constantly encircled by guards or the prying eyes of the court. Of course, Hamlet does have the opportunity to kill Claudius while he's praying, but defers it, ostensibly to more thoroughly damn him. Furthermore, Hamlet chastises himself precisely because nothing whatsoever obstructs his action. Quote, I do not know why yet I live to say this things to do, since I have cause and will and strength and means to do it, end quote. Others have suggested that Hamlet has serious ethical or religious misgivings about revenge that he is victim to a crisis of conscience. As one commenter puts it rather hyperbolically, quote, Hamlet's supreme characteristic is morality. He is constantly arrested in his impulses to do the deed by a superior code of ethics, end quote. How one could watch Hamlet carry out his casual slaughters over the course of the play and still claim that his supreme characteristic is morality is beyond me. Of the eight deaths that occur in the play, including Hamlet's own, Hamlet is effectively the cause of them all. He kills Polonius with barely a shred of compunction, needlessly drives Ophelia to madness and suicide, sends Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, his college buddies, to be beheaded in England without a second thought. Quote, they are not near my conscience, their defeat does by their own insinuation grow. End quote. When he learns of the poison on the foils, Hamlet not only stabs Claudius, but essentially drowns him by violently forcing an entire goblet of the poisoned wine down his throat. He does not appear to feel, uh, to, to grieve or feel any remorse for his mother's accidental death. For her, his only parting words are, wretched queen, adieu. Hamlet briefly exchanges forgiveness with Laertes for their mutual deaths, but he shows no regret for either. As other commenters have noted, Hamlet is less a paragon of morality than he is a hero villain, certainly a more sinister presence in Elsinore than the fumbling Claudius. Goethe suggested that Hamlet delays because the greatness of the duty laid upon him is simply too much for his delicate, fragile spirit to bear. Hamlet is like a beautiful vase that shatters when an oak is planted in it. Killing Claudius is hardly a great act, though. Shakespeare makes it clear that murder of kings like death of fathers, is a common theme of Hamlet's world, and that far greater kings than Claudius are murdered as a matter of course, including Hamlet Sr. and Fortinbras Sr. Rather, it is Elsinore that is the base that, that shatters when Prince Hamlet is planted in it, as the corpse-littered stage attests. One of the earliest critical analyses of Hamlet's delay, which Andrew mentions in his book, stated simply that Shakespeare was obliged to delay Hamlet's revenge. For if Hamlet killed Claudius outright, we would have a very short and rather uninteresting play. This claim, now aptly summarized in the critical commonplace, no delay, no play, is strictly speaking a truism. Without Hamlet's delay, there would be no tragedy of Hamlet, Prince of Denmark. For Hamlet's inaction simply is the entire action of the play. But I think what Andrew shows very clearly in his chapter on the subject is that it would be more true to say that without delay, there would be no Prince Hamlet either. Delay, or as Andrew more accurately characterizes it for Hamlet's case, tarrying with the negative, is the Prince's signature act and his way of being in the world. This means that Hamlet's tarrying is not a result of contingent circumstances, nor of an ethical dilemma, nor of some great discrepancy between agent and act. Indeed, it is not correct to think of Hamlet's tearing as some effect in need of a cause to explain it. Rather, to be Hamlet is to tear, and it is this negativity that Shakespeare dramatizes in the play. What does it mean, then, to tear with the negative? On good textual grounds, Andrew makes a case for distinguishing the meaning of the term to delay 
from that of Teteri in Shakespeare's vocabulary. Andrew writes that, quote, the primary sense of Terry in Shakespeare is to linger in a place without having to mind the clock. To delay, by contrast, means to be guilty of tardiness, especially from the standpoint of the court of law, end quote. Delay is associated with the urgent and obligatory demands of practical business, and its temporality is, epitom is epitomized in the regular and linear counting down of the water clock in the Athenian law court, where one delays at the risk of legal retribution. Andrew quotes Plato's Theotetus, quote, philosophical men always have what you spoke of just now, leisure. They conduct their arguments in peace and at leisure. Meanwhile, the man of rhetoric always has to speak under pressure of time, for the water clock carries him onwards, end quote. Carrying is thus associated with leisure, the time outside of or in excess of the political. For Socrates, to tarry is to make time for his characteristically playful thinking. The one who pursues this kind of leisurely play is paradoxically both childlike in their total lack of concern for the traditional Athenian social sphere. The philosopher, according to Socrates, does not even know the way to the marketplace or to the courthouse, let alone how to comport themselves when they arrive there. And yet they're also the image of the truest maturity, possessing a free, well-developed, and flourishing soul, as opposed to the slavishness that defines the stunted psychic development of the lawyers. When Socrates and his friends engage in the leisurely play of thought, they participate in a kind of negative praxis, an activity that is, within the coordinates of the Athenian social-political arena, a non-activity, a doing nothing, a way of spending time that seems to contribute nothing to the material well-being of the state, and thus may implicitly harm it. From the perspective of Athenian realpolitik, to tarry with Socrates is the worst kind of delay. Insofar as it ignores and explicitly devalues ta politica pragmata, the important business and the matters of state of the Athenian polis, it is a subversive activity. Hence the accusation of corrupting the youth. Socrates persuaded, baited, badgered, and flattered many of Athens' most promising up-and-coming politicians to tarry with the negative, to lay aside matters of business and state for a time and subject themselves to the awesome negative force of the Olympus. Hamlet's tearing is precisely the kind of extra-political action or negative praxis that is epitomized in Socrates' leisurely play of thought. Andrew writes, quote, to represent Hamlet as tarrying rather than as delaying is to represent him as standing outside the law, as Socrates does in the Theotetus. When he interrupts himself from murdering Claudius in Act 3, Scene 3, with the word no, he literally tarries with the negative. Uh, tarrying with the negative is a way of doing nothing, not in the sense of remaining inactive, but in the sense of performing a negative act or non-act that gains extra time or surplus time. Andrew goes on to argue that, similar to Socrates' subversive tarrying, Hamlet's tarrying is potentially revolutionary in the sense that it strives to transform the existing conditions of action. Quote, it seeks to make possible an effective act whose object at the present moment is impossible. While well, I'm quite persuaded uh, by Andrew's interpretation, uh, which explicates wonderfully the various ways in which Hegel, Marx, Benjamin, Badiou, and Zizek all perform this revolutionary Hamlet, in the time I have remaining, I'd like to explore a different, although related, facet of Hamlet's tarrying with the negative. This is the sense in which Hamlet tarries with the negative through play, the way in which he literally performs a negative act or non-act. Play is an even more versatile word in Shakespeare's vocabulary than in our own. In Shakespeare, to play has the usual meanings of to amuse oneself, especially at a game, to perform a part, to act or to pretend, or to play an instrument. It also means to manipulate or to beguile. Hamlet weaves the previous two senses together when he mocks Rosencrantz and Guildenstern for trying to pluck out the heart of his mystery, as if he were a pipe they could play upon. 
To play is also a synonym for to fence in Shakespeare, which is, of course, Hamlet's last play. Finally, to play means to tarry in exactly the sense Andrew describes in his book, as when the fourth countryman in The Two Noble Kinsmen is persuaded to give up a whole day's work for the May Day festivities. Quote, let the plow play today. I'll tickle it out of the jade's tails tomorrow. End quote. Here, to play means to stay idle, to take a holiday, to make time for something other than work or business. Although this meaning of to play is only once attested in Shakespeare's works, and indeed appears here in a scene that very well may have been written by John Fletcher rather than Shakespeare, I don't think it's difficult to see that this meaning is endemic to the various senses of play. To play a game, to play an instrument, to play at foils, to put on a play, are all leisurely activities performed outside of the practical sphere of everyday business, activities done in surplus time. Considered strictly from within the practical political perspective, all these ways of playing are negative acts or non-acts. They are not what one does as a member of the polis, but what one does as a private person in one's free time. Hamlet is one of Shakespeare's most playful characters in the Socratic sense of playfulness of thought, and is certainly the most histrionic and theater-obsessed consciousness in the plays. Theater is a paradigmatic negative act. When one performs, one acts and yet does nothing. One loves, hates, fights, prays, weeps, all for nothing, as Hamlet observes upon seeing the first player's tears for Hecuba. Hamlet associates theater and play with negative action when, in some of his very first lines, he wishes to radically distinguish himself from the actor. Quote, Seems, madam? Nay, it is, I know not seems. Tis not alone my inky cloak, good mother, nor customary suits of solemn black, nor windy suspiration of forced breath, no, nor the fruitful river in the eye, nor the dejected behavior of the visage, together with all forms, moods, shapes of grief that can denote me truly. These indeed seem, for there are actions that a man might play, but I have that within which pass us show, these but the trappings and the suits of woe." End quote. To play the grieving son would be to perform grief, but not to live it. Hamlet protests too much, though, and the rest of the play plainly refutes his own firm dichotomy between his true self and the many roles he plays. This is not to say that Hamlet's grief over his father's death is not genuine, but rather to say that he lives his grief by performing his grief to the rest of the court at Elsinore, and, more importantly, to himself in his soliloquies. Nothing illustrates the way Hamlet is Hamlet's own best audience, quite so clearly, as when, during an early soliloquy, he stops himself in the midst of self-castigation and overhears his own performance. Quote, Am I a coward? Who calls me villain, breaks my pate across, plucks off my beard and blows it in my face, tweaks me by the nose, gives me the lie in the throat as deep as to the lungs? Who does me this? End quote. It is only Hamlet who calls Hamlet coward and villain in this near dissociative episode. To propose a facile solution to another classic debate, the question whether Hamlet is actually insane rather than just acting mad is almost a non-question, for he lives the roles he plays, and thus is mad because he acts mad. Although Hamlet agonizes over the fact that he must compulsively unpack his heart with words and performance, his obsessive theatricality will not allow him to stop playing until his death. Almost all of Hamlet's time is spent putting on plays. There are properly three plays within the play here. First, there is the excerpt from the unnamed revenge tragedy that the first player performs concerning Pyrrhus' murder of Priam and Hecuba's grief. This play is directed by Hamlet, who all but demonstrates exactly how he would like it performed when he recites the first dozen lines from memory. Second, there is the mouse trap which is written and directed by Hamlet. Hamlet requests to insert some dozen or 16 lines of his own into the murder of Gonzago, 
but it seems likely that once he got started writing, he found it difficult to stop at 16. The Player King's purpose is but the slave to memory speech can only be Hamlet's reflection on his own unpaid debt. Beforehand, Hamlet again instructs the players how he wants his play performed, this time with a remarkable reflection on the purpose of playing and its techniques, as well as a firm enjoiner not to improvise, but to stick to his script. Finally, there is the madness of Hamlet, of which Hamlet is the writer, director, and sole actor, although everyone at Elsinore becomes embroiled in its performance. This is Hamlet's magnum opus, manifestly more important to him than revenging himself upon Claudius. For what purpose does it play in furthering Hamlet's revenge? Hamlet does not tell us why he finds it, quote, meet to put an antic disposition on, end quote. And we are hard pressed to give any account of its expediency for killing Claudius. In Saxo and Belleforest's histories, the source text for the play, from the very beginning, Amleth, which is uh, Hamlet's precursor, is in grave danger from his uncle and avoids certain death by acting the fool. Shakespeare's Hamlet, by contrast, is in absolutely no danger whatsoever at the start of the play, and Claudius indeed appears eager to be Hamlet's foster father. In reality, there is no particular reason why he should act antically, except for the sake of the play itself. To tarry is to make time, and Hamlet makes time only for play, putting on his plays, playing upon Polonius, Ophelia, and the rest of Elsinore's court, and in Hamlet's solitary play of thought. To play is to do nothing, to perform a negative action as an actor performs their role. To tarry with the negative thus means for Hamlet to defer his revenge and all other positive praxis for the sake of play. I've suggested that to be Hamlet is to tarry with the negative in this way. Perhaps, then, it is better to ask why Hamlet is so short rather than so long. Indeed, why does it end at all? Why does Hamlet return to Denmark after his interrupted journey to England? Why does he come back to the court at Elsinore to kill and to be killed? If Hamlet's essence is to play, how can we make sense of Hamlet's apparent abandonment of play in the moment that he murders Claudius? When Horatio and Hamlet hears the king's summons for Hamlet to fence with Laertes, both realize there is some plot afoot. Horatio encourages Hamlet to tarry. Quote, if your mind dislike anything, obey it. I will forestall the repair hither and say you are not fit, end quote. But Hamlet refuses. Quote, not a whit. We defy augury. There is special providence in the fall of a sparrow. If it be now, tis not to come. If it, be, if it be not to come, it will be now. If it be not now, yet it will come. The readiness is all. Since no man of aught he leaves knows aught, what is it to leave the times? Let be. End quote. Hamlet can quote scripture and make it sound like nihilism. The readiness is all. Hamlet says he is finally ready to perform the act of his own death and the death of Claudius, and paradoxically both defies those who would pluck out the heart of his mystery by divination, and yet also affirms the special providence guiding his own path to annihilation. But whose providence is it? The only God Hamlet recognizes is death, and death too defies our attempt to augur it, despite the fact that its universal providence circumscribes all. Death is the divinity that shapes our final ends, no matter what rough path we hew to it, and Hamlet enters the fencing match prepared to act out the inevitable conclusion to his own play. Has Hamlet experienced some great sea change between Acts 4 and 5? No, the only change is that Hamlet's theatricality has been magnified exponentially, or has been carried out to its logical conclusion. The play is the thing in itself for Hamlet, and by the end of Act 5, the boundary between negative and positive praxis is eroded the division between theater and real life completely undone. Hamlet says that the purpose of playing is, quote, to hold as twere the mirror up to nature, to show virtue her feature, scorn her own image, and the very age and body of the time his form and pressure, end quote. 
Hamlet's play acting mirrors the age in Denmark, for it is Hamlet's own theatricality that is the defining feature of the time and its disjointure. Hamlet's play mirrors nature because reality for Hamlet is itself a play and all of the world's a stage, as another one of Shakespeare's famous melancholiacs puts it. In playing his madness, Hamlet plays himself, for there is no scene we can trace here between role and actor. Playing himself, he holds a mirror to a mirror, infinitely reduplicating the absence of any single concrete and permanent image. The power of representation in Hamlet's hands takes on the character of this supreme negativity. Thank you. Exclusive relations that it 
engages in without a conceptual context. This view is contrasted with the semantic atomism, according to which the sense of a content can be determined and grasped prior to considering the exclusive relations that it establishes with other contexts. When Hegel says that, quote, differenti differen differentiated determinate properties are established simultaneously one being the negative of, of another, end quote, Hegel is committed to the weak individual holism that material incompatibility is necessary for the determinateness of a content rather than the strong individual holism that such incompatibility is sufficient for the determinacy of a content. Brandon holds that Hegel is not committed to the strong holism which makes determinate content is unintelligible by reducing what should be determined by standing in exclusive relations to other con contents into the relations themselves. In this strong individual holism, quote, the relata are in a sense dissolved into the relations between them. And at this point, we have a chicken and egg problem. The relations are individuated by their relata, and the relata by the relations they stand in. But relations between what exactly? Intelligibility of the relations itself is threatened. Hegel's symmetric conception of relative individuation seems to make Hegel committed to strong holism. This symmetric conception suggests that all determining contents are established simultaneously, quote, each individuated by its relations to the other, end quote. This metric view is contrasted with the asymmetric conception that a semantic, semantic content can be determined before it is articulated by the relations of material exclusion. By holding that the exclusive reading, the exclusive relations among contents are essentially required for determinate content points, Hegel seems to get close to, close to the strong holism which turns out to be incoherent after all. In order to distinguish weak, weak semantic holism from strong semantic holism, it is important to see how immediacy can come into the holistic picture of experience. As Brandon says, quote, immediacy plays a crucial role in Hegel's distinctive kind of holism, end quote. Then how can immediacy be combined with Hegel's symmetric conception of relative individuation? Here, Brandon suggests explicating Hegel's objective idealism as an extension and supplementation of Herman, the Harman point between, Harman distinction between inferential relations and inferential processes. While Harman distinguishes the inferential relations which specify the relations among different logical elements such as entailment and, and incompatibility from the inferential processes or practices, Hegel generalizes and expands this point by holding that the understanding of the former essentially requires the understanding of the latter, and vice versa. That is, the objective relations of material incompatibility cannot be understood without understanding the inferential processes and practices based on the subjective incompatibility relations of commitments. And the inferential practices of subjects cannot be understood apart from the objective relations of material incompatibility. As Dr. Kutrafala summarizes Brendan's point, quote, objective idealism then is the semantic basis that objective relations of material exclusion and implication are reciprocally sense dependent on the subjective practices of inferences. According to Brendan, this thesis objective idealism as a generalization and extension of the Herman point shows how Hegel can avoid the problem of strong individuation of holism despite his symmetric conception of relative individuation. That is, the problem of how we can introduce and reserve immediacy into a holistic picture of experience without dissolving it into an exclusive relation. Brendan says that this problem can be solved by seeing immediacy as cons consisting of one of the three distinct bases that an inferential process consists of, end quote. The passages that seem to commit him to strong holism should be understood rather as corresponding to ultimately inadequate phase in the process of grasping the 
requesting or understanding a holistic relation of the strip structure and cult. In the first phase, in the first phase, one takes a property as immediately contentful. Noticing that something is frequently there, one takes its property as graspable without considering its relations to other properties. However, this phase is unstable since if the immediate given properties to be understood as intermittently contentful. One should also consider the material incompatibility relations that it establishes with other properties. Determinate negation as material incompatibility that we discussed in the beginning part turns out to be the second phase of the process here, and this is the point where the problem of strong policy can arise. The final phase of the the inferential process solves the problem by combining the first two. Immediacy and mediation are combined so that we can grasp the fully mediated immediacy. Immediacy of observable properties is construed as signs expressing the rich reality articulated by determinate negation and mediation. Dr. Kutcher fellow puts Brandon's point as follows, quote, this risk overcome, however, the level of understanding. When consciousness reintroduces the determinate contents of the first stage, now represented not as immediate events, but as signs that express the exclusions and implications generated at the second stage. By representing observer observables as signs of theoretically articulable relations and complexes, Hegel is able to ground his semanticism in semantic semiotic atoms of <coughs> experience. Brandon expl explicates the specific features of the inferential process by attributing Hegel the pragmatist thesis that, quote, the use of concepts determines their contents, end quote, and the conceptual idealist thesis that, quote, the structure and the unity of the concept is the same <coughs> as the structure and unity of the self, end quote. The pragmatist thesis states that the production of concepts is not separated from the implication of concepts. Concepts are not fixed items whose content can be determined before the actual application of concepts. When we actually use the concepts by applying them in our judgments and actions, the conceptual contents are altered and developed at the same time. As Brenda puts the point, quote, conceptual content arises out of the process of applying concepts. The determining content of concepts is unintelligible apart from the determination of the content, the process of determining it, end quote. Hegel's conceptual idealist thesis states that the structure of concepts is identical with the structure of the self. Brandon says that for Hegel, to be a self or an I is to take up uh, a normative attitude toward oneself. By taking up a normative attitude toward oneself, one becomes a possible more or, a, or an agent who can be responsible for what it says and does. This normative character of the self makes the nature of the self closely connected to that of concepts as contents of feelings. The normative status that the self can possess as a possible more and agent is a social achievement based on mutual recognition. recognition. In order to achieve the normative status, one should be able to commit it to or responsible for one's judgments and actions. In turn, one should be able to recognize as a possible norm for an agent who can undertake normative commitments by other norms and agents. Selves are achieved by mutual recognition of self-conscious individuals and their communities are simultaneously instituted as the universals to which the particular selves belong. The structure of a self and a community as the social form of mutual, form of mutual recognition should be expanded to the historical dimension. The relations of mutual recognition are constituted among different slices of history. On the one hand, the past applications of concepts supply the precedents that serve as rationals available to justify later decisions. In this sense, past applications of concepts are the source of conceptual contents that future norms or agents can apply and endorse. On the other hand, future concept users assess the correctness or incorrectness of past 
application set concepts. Only applications assessed as correct by future users can provide conceptual norms for future applications. Brendan says, quote, in doing so, the future applications exercise a reciprocal authority over past ones, end quote. Section two. One of the problems that Dr. Kutcherfellow raises against Brendan's interpretation of Hegel is that there are some aspects of subjects that cannot be accounted for in terms of the subjective incompatibility relations of normative commitments. While Brendan takes the determinacy of a self and a community consisting in, in the mutual recognition of normatively committed individuals, Dr. Kutcherfellow holds that there should be a more fundamental structure of a subject than the subjective incompatibility relations of normative commitments. In the case of CJ, the symbolic, the symbolic identification is presented as more fundamental than normative commitments. Dr. Kutcherfellow says, here comes a bit long uh, quote. For CJ, normative commitment is subordinate deity to something more funda fundamental, namely symbolic identification. By taking on symbolic, by taking on a symbolic identity, one comes to be recognized by others as entitled to make certain normative commitments. Such an entitlement consists in the limited powers of determination, that is, portions of the general social power to pre predicate something of something. Symbolic identities make normative commitments possible while retaining their status as fundamental enigmas that, enigmas that cause us anxiety. These twofold character is evidenced in the kinds of ultimate justifications they grant, typically self-referential pronouncements of the sort because I said so, where the first of the I is split between the assumed social role and the anxious subject secretly wondering whether or why this is his or her role. Since self-binding normative commitments presuppose the underlying birth of symbolic commitments over which we have limited control, they carry with them a secondary, reflexive, and rationalizing character. Normativity itself, like normality and abnormality, abnormality is a byproduct of symbolic identification. According to Zizek, Brandon, according to Zizek, Brandon, like Pippin, overlooks this fact. It is because the symbolic order is virtual or fictional that the world it frames is incompletely determined. Determinate negation is the permanent possibility of radically transforming the symbolic order." End quote. Before one is committed to one's assumed social status and responsibilities, what one faces first is a symbolic identification. The twofold characteristic of the symbolic Identification involves the normative aspects of subjectivity based on mutual recognition among self-conscious individuals. However, it remains as a fundamental <coughs> fundamental enigma, enigmas that cause us anxiety. Quote. While one is committed to an assumed social world, one could still feel anxious, quote, secretly wondering whether or why this is his or her world. A similar objection can be found regarding the objective side as well. While Brandon takes determin the determinacy of an objective content as consisting in the incompatibility relations of material exclusion, not every aspect of an object is determined in terms of material incompatibility relations. Dr. Kutcherfellow says that, quote, Brandon's world is permanent in the sense that it is impervious to genuine becomings and events. Becomings, in the strict Heraclitian sense, a situation in which being P does not materially exclude being not P, end quote. While Brandon takes the Hegelian notion of determinate negation as expressing the material incompatibility relations which are codified by the principle of non-contradiction that P excludes not P, this picture associated with the principle of non-contradiction cannot accommodate the quasi Vesalian thought that material relations can be consistent and contradictory. At first sight, these, 
These criticisms might seem to be simply the random neglects, neglects being complete and limited characteristics of normative commitments on the subjective side, and those are material determinants on the objective side. If this is the case, however, random would seem to have the conceptual resources to, to accommodate the concrete characteristics of the objective and subjective determinants within his semantic interpretation of Hegel's idealism. First, although it is true that random takes the essence of a self and a community as their ability to undertake normative commitments, he also seems to be aware of the limited power that rational subjects have when they undertake normative, com normative commitments. In a sense, the very structure of a self and a community essentially involves the restriction of their, de their determining powers. Since, nor since the normative structure of selves and communities are social achievements based on mutual recognition, being a self, quote, is not something one can achieve all on one's own, according to Brandon. While an individual has a sort of autonomy that the decision to commit oneself a norm is up to the individual, the autonomy should also be constrained by others' assessments. The incomplete characteristics of one's determining power can be seen more clearly when we expand the structure of mutual recognition to the dimension of history. Within the historical dimension of mutual recognition, current commitments are not the last words, since the current judgments should also be constrained by future applications of concepts. The current judgments and actions can count as incorrect according to the commitments that will be made by future knowers and agents. Dr. Petrofalo presents Brandon's idea as follows, quote, and the sedimentations of past commitments and traditions are conservative, but they are also inherently subject to challenge. By working through both the past claim on the present and the present claims on the past, we can change both the present and the past, end quote. According to this picture, neither a subject nor a community can give the last word about the determining contents of conceptual norms. Conceptual norms can be determined different, differently according to different processes of mutual negotiation. As Brandon says, quote, since this process has no endpoints in principle, no finally authoritative authority, not dependent in turn on its acknowledgement or recognition, the normative situation is uh, the normative situation is entirely symmetrical. Given that the possible conflicts and changes among different commitments are inherent in Brendan's holistic picture, one might wonder why we should think that these features cannot account for the aspects on the subjective side over which we have limited control, according to Dr. Petrofello. Dr. Petrofello. Similarly, the determinacy of objective contents is also subject to further revisions in this holistic picture. The point seems to be play, this point seems to play a crucial role when Brandon connects Hegel's conception of infinity with his metropolism. When Brandon cites Hegel's remarks that infinity, quote, infinity in which whatever is determined in one way or another is rather the, op the opposite of this determinateness. This no doubt has been from the start the soul of all that has gone before. Brandon argues that the infinity construed as the opposite of determinateness consists of quote, the final holistic conception of the conception, end quote. Although Brandon thinks that objective contents should be determined in terms of material incompatibility relations, he also thinks that such incompatibility such incompatibility relations are subject to further revisions and that Hegel's conception of infinity develops this point. Then, one might wonder again why these features cannot compare to the incomplete features of genuine becomings and events. Section 3. However, the fundamental, the fundamental problem that Dr. Petrofella finds in Brandon is not just that Brandon neglects the incomplete features 
of the objective and subjective determination, but that random neglects the complete features in the objective side that, that cannot be meditated, mediated in terms of material and compatibility relations, and those in the subjective side that cannot be reduced to the social dimension of normative commitments. While Brandon introduces indeterminate features of objects and subjects in terms of the infinite process, the infinite process of inferential pra practices, they are further determinable in terms of material incompatibility and mutual policy of normative commitments. However, the incompleteness in question that matters for Dr. Kutcher Fellow's criticism of Brandon would be neither the kind of immediacy that can be mediated in terms of incompatibility relations of material exclusion, nor the kind of normative commitments that can be adjusted according to the practical attitudes of other rational subjects. To put the problem differently, Brandon lacks the incomplete features of objects and subjects which arise because we lack the objective correlative for the metaphysical dimension of things in themselves. Brandon misses this point, quote, since his pragmatism doesn't entail metaphysical idealism, according to Dr. Petrifello. The reason why there must be a more fundamental structure of a subject than the mutual policing of conceptual norms is that there are some aspects of our subjective lives that cannot be determined and defined in terms of the social responsibility that we undertake as possible norms and agents. And those aspects that cannot be determined in terms of the compatibility relations on the objective and subjective sides should be conceived as grounded on something that we can call things in themselves following Kant. Hegel posits this unfathomable, unfathomable X as absolute idea. Hegel takes the absolute idea, idea not only as the ultimate reality, but also an idea, quote, an idea that is its own objective correlative by, re, quote, by removing the content distinction between appearances and things in themselves, according to Dr. Petrifello. However, this move remains problematic since we cannot find any object in the world that can be really correlated with the conception of the absolute idea. Revel revelations of absolute knowing and of absolute unknowing, according to Dr. Kutcherfellow. Dr. Kutcherfellow argues that Brandon neglects the metaphysical problem that Hegel confronts, quote, because he takes absolute idealism to be equivalent to objective idealism conceived in terms of the view that determinate negation is material exclusion plus conceptual idealism conceived as normative pragmatism, end quote. I agree with Dr. Kutcherfellow's view that Brandon's semantic policy unfairly neglects the metaphysical dimension that our experiences presuppose. And I believe this neglect makes Brandon, Brandon's semantic policy that he develops through his reading of Hegel incoherent after all. First, we can go back to the expanded Herman point that the understanding of the holistic picture of the world requires the understanding of the inferential process which consists of three different phases. In the first phase, our perceptual experiences of observable properties are immediately, that is, non-inferentially elicited. However, the immediately elicited signs cannot exhibit any determinateness yet. One is led to the second phase where one articulates the contents in terms of determinate negation or material incompatibility relations and consequence relations. In the final phase of the inferential process, one combines the first two in order not to make the relations empty, having no intrinsic relative. In the final stage, in this final stage, one is said to understand the holistic stru structure of experiences by grasping fully mediated immediacy, according to Brandon. However, it does not seem clear how immediacy can come into the holistic picture according to this account. While Brandon explains the mediating process which should be combined with immediacy in order to provide determinate contents, Brandon seems to remain silent about how immediacy can 
come into our consciousness in the first place. If our perceptual experiences of observable properties are said to be immediate in the sense that they are elicited not inferentially as Brendan says, there have to be some items to elicit these responses from us besides the perceptual frameworks in which we are engaged while perceiving those properties. The presupposed items cannot, could not already have the determinate structures articulated in terms of inferential relations and practices, since those items are presupposed as affecting us to initiate the inferential process. The determinate structure of our experiences could be said to be complete, since there is no end point, end point for the determining practices. If we can and should say that experiences nevertheless exhibit some determinate aspects, the presupposed things in themselves would be indeterminate in the sense that they are not subject to our conceptual articul articulation based on incompatibility relations of material exclusion and normative commitments. We can transcendentally conceive such items as being a condition which enables our conceptually articulated experiences, but we cannot grasp it what kind of determinate structures those items would have. The distinction between appearances and things in themselves is preserved as a mark which expresses the inevitable gap between the complete determinacy of experiences and the unknown but presupposed ground of such determinacy. To put the same point differently, it does not seem to be clear how the asymmetric relation between immediacy and mediated determinacy can be introduced with Brendan's semantic holism, while Brendan says that, quote, the asymmetric sense dependence at the second level depends on the asymmetric sense dependence of the second level of the first, of the second level of the first, end quote. This consideration seems to require us to presuppose things in themselves as one of the poles which enable such an asymmetric relation by providing the better for immediacy besides the symmetric, beside the semantical structures which are articulated in terms of incompatibility relations. As Dr. Kutcherfellow says, quote, thus, although there couldn't be a world that is, again, an incomplete world without subjects in it, it is the world itself that serves as the fixed point of um, a symmetric ground in relation, end quote. The fixed point is presupposed, but not determined to be known. However, we cannot remove, however, we cannot remove such a metaphysical point either, since the very structure of our experience requires and is dependent on the presupposition of the thing itself. Thank you. Okay, so we'll take about a five, ten minute break, uh, and then we'll come back here from Dr. Nett. Thank
undetected from one victim to another, a movement so mysterious that it had long attributed to occult forces. The concept of contagion was provided a solution to the problem in natural philosophy known as action at a distance. The question was how a body separated in space from another body could act on it without touching it. The primacy of touch and physical contact and debates over such phenomena is evident in the ubiquity of derivatives of the Latin terms tactus, tango, contango, and contagio. The emphasis on such terms is the product of an early modern philosophical landscape in which the compromises of Christian Neoplatonism and Arabic and scholastic Aristotelianism were increasingly unable to account for the growing body of evidence grounded in empirical observation. Though the hard materialism of Hobbes, Gassendi, or Cavendish would later uh, develop in the 17th century, the initial result of this revisionism was not a reconfirmation of Aristotelian hylomorphic materialism or even Lucretian atomism against dualist claims of Neoplatonism Christian theology, or Thomist scholasticism. Rather, the late 16th century witnessed a preoccupation with the manner in which mysterious and seemingly immaterial forces or entities interacted with the sensible matter of the world. As I will suggest today, this preoccupation surf surfaces at important moments in Shakespeare when the poet has been taken to either draw on the conventional language of the state of the soul or point to a nascent conception modern subject. As Daniel Heller Rosen argues, Aristotle gave primacy of place to touch, noting that, quote, by the term sensible, he meant tactile. For him, tangible qualities were ultimately equivalent to the qualities of a body as a body, end quote. Rosen goes on to point out that Aristotle was apparently unconcerned about the problem of consciousness, and specifically the question of, uh, quote, where to set the bounds beyond which touch could not venture the limits at which sense grows dull, obliged to relinquish its rights to the more subtle powers, desire and movement, imagination, memory, and intellection. While in the age, this is still Rosen, the age of do the domination of the knowledge being the question is a pressing one, it appears not to have occurred to the ancient philosophy, according to Rosen. Thoughtful or thoughtless, still Rosen, Conscious or not, the life of the animal in his eyes remained a matter of tact before all else. Recent work on early modern medical theory points to the legacy of this kind of thinking in the Renaissance. As recent scholarship on early modern medicine has taught us, physicians' attempts to explain the cause of the plague and other contagious diseases led to a revision of Aristotelian and Galenic theories, increasing the understanding of physical afflictions as the result, uh, the result of contagious transmission of exogenous material, a revision that extended the importance of touch to the realm of the unseen. The advances of Guillermo Fracastoro and Paracelsus pointed to exogenous matter, material but invisible particles called semina, or seeds after Lucretius, as the carriers of the plague. According to Fracastoro, these semina entered bodies unseen via the air, making contact with the material humors and thus accounting for internal fluctuations of the humors that otherwise appeared to have no cause. Thus, these new theories co continue to accommodate aspects of Galenic humoralism, while simultaneously anticipating the modern discoveries of microbiology in the 19th century. The materialist focus of early modern physicians has been interpreted by recent scholars as a sign of encroaching modernity. Super superstitious beliefs in the occult nature of plague transmission, for example, while still common at the turn of the 17th century, were to be displaced by empirically minded rationalists interested in discovering confirmed causes of disease rather than hypothesizing about the unknown nature of the realms that lay beyond the reach of the senses. Studying the afflicted physical body in pain and after death through vivisection, early modern physicians increasingly turned away from ancient and medieval authorities and based their theories on the material facts. That's the going narrative, at least the scholarly narrative. Nevertheless, the peculiar convergence of key terms like contagion on both sides of the material-immaterial divide suggests that there was an ongoing fascination with the most vexing of the, mis of the mysteries pertaining to the human organism. Contact between the physical structures of the body, including the brain, and the immaterial or extra-material realm of thought, the mind, and the intellective and mental soul. As Daryl Chalk has shown in a series of recent articles, the easy transposition of discourses of contagion from the medical to the moral realm, 
especially in English anti-theatrical discourse, points to a cultural fascination with the mystery of physical and mental contact at the turn of the 17th century. The power of the newly developing theories of material uh, contagion supplied anti-theatricalists with a figure for moral infection through the contagion of the theater. But rather than simply drawing a metaphor from the medical discourse to characterize the moral corruption of the stage, anti-theatricalists seized on a lacuna in the in medical account that left the door open for an interpretation of contagion as an immaterial phenomenon, in a, in a sort of correlative to a material phenomenon. Importantly, contagion was not limited to physical illnesses like plague and syphilis, but also extended to mental disorders, including lovesickness, moral corruption, and other passions of the mind, as they were called. Those seeking to limit the weight of empirically unconfirmable speculation in causal accounts, physicians could not explain the point of contact between mind and body, except through reference to the immaterial. I'm talking here really about the turn of the 17th century. We all know some of the later 17th century solutions to this problem. Thus, while French physician Jean Fernal asserted that, quote, whatever we perceive in our mind drew its whole origin from the senses, he could go on to discuss the connection between mind and body aided by the most rarefied spirit in terms that sound suspiciously dualist. This is uh, the long quote, the first quote on the handout. He says, academics were first to realize that it was impossible to utterly, uh, for utterly different natures to enter a combining association except by the intervention of some suitable intermediary. They considered that before our soul, the work of who, the work of the supreme craftsman of things appeared and entered into this compact, solid body, it was clad in some shining body, pure and starlike, as a simple garment. And this, being immortal and eternal, could never, could never be parted from the mind, which could not become an inhabitant of the world without it. Then they went on to place another body around the mind, a thin and simple one, but rather impure, less shining and bright than the previous one. This one is not the work of the Supreme Craftsman, but composed from a mixture of elements, particularly the more rarefied ones, from which it acquires the name airy and ethereal. Kent now in these two bodies, the mind is banished into this third body, a mortal and transient one, or rather it is exiled into a foul and gloomy prison, and becomes a visitor to the earth until it bursts out to return nimbly to the freedom of its fatherland and becomes a citizen of heaven. It's a great flair for writing from a physician, I think. The link between the body and the immaterial soul mind is the most uh, refined form of spirit, according to Fernal. This is a term retained from the Hellenic theory. It's a very suitable link between body and mind in Fernal's work, intervening to reconcile and hold opposed natures together. This particularly rarefied spirit is able to serve as the link because, quote, it is exceedingly intimate with both, and not being completely devoid of body, it can be placed in a coarse body, but being more rarefied and bright, it can be linked to the mind. Sharing us in both, after a fashion, it bonds a nature without body to corporeal nature, the immortal to the mortal, the pure to the impure, the divine to the earthly. For now, evidence of the, exist for the existence of this most rarefied spirit, the intermediary between mind and body, is an absence. Interesting. Anyone who has not yet fully grasped, again, this is for now, uh, its substance as standing after considering the structure of our body should visit the arteries and gaze into the cardiac cavity and the cerebral ventricles. He will see them empty, virtually devoid of humor, but not created so large by nature without a reason. When he turns his mind to them, I think, he will soon grasp mentally that a very rarefied air filled them during the animal's life, but while it breathed its last, was so very light that it escaped unperceived. The theory of the breath of life is familiar here, explained both the manner in which the soul departs the body and the reason we need to breathe, for according to Fresnel, if we had no rarefied or spirit of substance in us, there would undoubtedly be hardly any need for us to inhale. Air, as Carlo Masio has reminded us, is among the most contested sites of exchange between material and immaterial conceptions of infection in the early modern era. References to contagion in Shakespeare are almost always to air, fogs, clouds, etc. These ethereal substances that can have a corrupting effect on those exposed. Equally important in discussions of contagion as corrupting touch is the concept of stain. Taint 
from attain, attain, uh, attaint, and attain, and the related taint, highlight an alteration of form upon infection. The convention of the tainted mind or soul is to describe a state of corruption. Here, the rape of Lucrece is exemplary. Though Lucrece's stained soul is unseen, its cause can be traced to Tarquin's material touch. Quote, the wolf hath seized his prey, the poor lamb cries, till when her own white fleece, her voice controlled, entombs her outcry in her lips sweet bowl. Initially, she hopes to find refuge in her steadfast mind. Though my gross uh, blood be stained with his abuse, immaculate and spotless is my mind. That was not forced. That never was inclined to accessory yieldings. But pu still pure duck in her poisoned closet, yet endure. The material result of the assault is irreversible for Lucrece, however, as she that was Lucrece is no more. How may this force of stain be wiped from me? She asks rhetorically. What is the quality of my offense being constrained with dreadful circumstance? May my pure mind with the foul act dispense my low declined honor to advance? May any terms acquit me from this chance? The poisoned fountain clears itself again, and why not I from this compelled stain? Despite the insistence of the onlookers that her body stain, this is what they say, her body stain, her mind untainted clears, Lucrece insists that no dame hereafter living by my excuse shall claim excuses given. This is the path Lucrece must take to secure her legend as an exemplar of female moral purity, uh, written by a man, of course, but it is one that charts a difficult path along the material immaterial divide. Though her spotless mind was never forced, the closet in which it was encased was nonetheless poisoned. Her appeal to Tarkin was mounted along precisely this divide, first to his material body's scarlet lust, which came evidence to swear that her poor beauty had purloined his eyes. She pleads in Tarkin's likeness, I did thee entertain thee. Hast thou put on this shape to do him shame? But then she turns to address his immaterial self. To thee, to thee, my heaved up hands appeal, not to seducing lust, thy rash relier. I sued for exile, exile of majesty's repeal. Let him return, and flattering thoughts retire. His true respect will prison false desire, and wipe the dim mist from thy doting eye, that thou shalt see thy state and pity mine. Following the attack, the priest wakes her heart by beating her own breast, and bids it leap from thence where it may find some pure chest to close so pure a mind. The weakened body is susceptible to infection, as her subsequent musings on uh, the corruption of nature reveal. She bemoans this weakness, noting that unruly blasts wait on the tender spring, drawing on the same natural image that Laertes will invoke in counseling Ophelia against Hamlet's advances. Quote, this is from Hamlet, in the morn and liquid dew of youth, contagious blastments are most imminent. The release of the soul from the body, and by extension, Lucrece's undeserved moral taint, also marks a transition from mind to soul. Even here, she sheathed in her harmless breath, breast a harmful knife that vents her soul unsheathed. That blow did veil it from the deep unrest of that polluted prison where it breathed. Her contrite sighs into the clouds bequeathed her winged sprite, and through her wounds doth fly life's lasting date from canceled destiny. Shakespeare's Lucrece thus maintains that the mind can remain pure while the body is irrevocably polluted through corrupting touch. The confusion between mind and soul is something that's a little more complicated, I think, to talk about. The key is the contact point, however, as is uh, evident in, a, in another example, this time from the Comedy of Errors. You may recall that union and separation are central to the thematics of the play, as the primary action results from the vi violent separation of Aegean and Amelia, resulting in a severing of family ties, husband from wife, and twin from twin. A recurrent image in the play is the liquid self. Early on, Antipolis of Syracuse compares himself to a drop of water in the ocean. I to the world and like a drop of water that in the ocean seeks another drop, who, falling there to find his fellow forth unseen, inquisitive, confounds himself. 
So I, to find a mother and a brother, in quest of them, unhappy, lose myself. In scolding Antipholus of Syracuse, whom she believes to be her husband, Antipholus of Ephesus, Adriana uses the same image, but here the concern is with contamination. How comes it now, Mrs. Thelio of Hispaniano? How comes it now, my husband? Oh, how comes it that thou art thus estranged from thyself? Thyself, I call it, being strange to me, that undividable, incorporate, and better than thy dear self's better part. Ah, do not tear away that self from me, for know, my love, as easy mayest thou fall, a drop of water in the breaking gulf, and take unmingled that same drop again without addition or dimension, as take from me thyself and not me too. Adriana's image extends Antipholus' earlier image of the drop mingled and lost in a larger body of water. Just as he loses his self in the ocean in search of his mother and brother, just as he becomes part of that body in which he searches, Adriana and Antipholus are corporeally mingled in one fluid self in marriage. The conventional language of marriage as an incorporation of two bodies into one ensures that it is impossible for her to distinguish her substance from his. The notion of incorporation is tactile, as Adriana's subsequent concern over contamination makes clear. How dearly would it touch thee to the quick, shouldst thou but hear I were licentious, and that this body, consecrated to thee by ruffian lust, should be contaminated. Wouldst thou not spit at me and spurn me and hurl the name of husband in my face and tear the stained skin off my harlot brow and from my false hand cut the wedding ring and break it with a deep divorcing vow? I know thou canst, and therefore see thou do it. I am possessed with an adulterous blot. My blood is mingled with the crime of lust. For if we too be one and thou play false, uh, I do digest the poison of thy flesh, being strumpeted by thy contagion. As it turns out, unsurprisingly in the context of the comedy, neither Antipholus of Syracuse nor Adriana's actual husband, Antipholus of Ephesus, is actually an adulterer, if these men have been revealed. Uh, but this heightens the rhetorical effect of the hypothetical contamination at a distance that Adriana feels as a result of the presumption of Antipholus's guilt. That she speaks hypothetically, but concerning matters of grave importance regarding moral virtue is captured in her final advice to Antipholus. Keep then fair league with truce, uh, and truce with thy true bed. I live, and this is a little bit strange because it's a textual issue here, but she says, I live, I live disdain, D-I-S hyphen stain, like unstain, right? He, undisarmed, you, uh, sorry, um, thou undishonored. The sense here is that if Antipholus can be faithful, the irreversible stain on their incorporate flesh will be removed. She disdained, he undishonored. A reversal that is paradoxically only achievable through prevention. For as we learn from Lucrece, one stain, the mortal flesh is irreversibly corrupted. This brings me to the prominent role that contagion and moral staining play in the hand. Much has been written of the disease imagery in the play, which finds its emblem in Marcellus's ominous, uh, ominous observation that something is rotten in the state of Denmark. The comment, to which no one responds, interestingly, establishes corruption within the body of the state. Disease leading to decay from within is consonant with the Galenic uh, conception of illness as a result of an internal imbalance of humors. Such imbalances were thought to expose one to external threats, usually borne by corrupt air. Importantly, Shakespeare always uses the term contagious to indicate a dangerously corrupt atmosphere, usually in the form of corrupt air, as I mentioned, but also fogs, clouds, as when Titania describes the contagious fogs that hover over the wasted landscape that has resulted from her feud with Oberon in a Midsummer Night's Dream. Yet such, such seemingly literal references to the contagious nature of the uh, corrupt atmosphere consistently turn on the contagiousness of mental states. Even Titania's ostensibly literal reference to corrupted air alludes to the mental and emotional discord that plagues the fairy world in terms of the feud between Titania and Oberon. Moreover, for example, has included, for example, King Henry's threat at the gates of Park Fleur that, quote, the filthy and contagious clouds of heavy murder, spoil, and villainy may overcome his men should he lose command of them. 
Though the use of the term appears to suggest a proto-modern pathogenic understanding of contagion in the vein of Fracastoro, the emphasis is actually on the soldiers to whom such behavior is presumably endogenous. Consider Henry Henry VIII, when Gardner advocates harsh punishment for Cranmer in order to avoid the spread of heresy. And I'm just reading by this. If we suffer out of our easiness and childish pity to one man's honor, this contagious sickness, farewell all physic, and what follows then? Commotions, uproars, with a general taint of the whole state, as of late days our neighbors, the upper Germany, can dearly witness, freshly pitied in our men's memories. The connection between contagious sickness, the contagious sickness of heresy, and the general taint of the state recalls the rotten state of Denmark and suggests that such corruption spreads in the minds of the infected. Both rotten state and general taint conjure the specter of the plague, a disease still attributed to supernatural powers in the 17th century. Jonathan, Jonathan Gilbert Paris has pointed out the odd resistance to the view that the plague was contagious through touch, as older views, including the explanation that it was a punishment from God, persisted well into the Restoration. Nevertheless, the tactile theory of contagion was in circulation in England at the turn of the 17th century. The English physician Francis Herring, and this is on the handout as well, cites Fracastoro's contagion, that's the title of Fracastoro's test, in his modest defense of the caveat given to wearers of empoisoned amulets as preservatives from the plague, a real barn burner of the text, right? Um, and he says this, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but a little bit. So you see the plague is placed by physicians in that rank of sharp diseases which are contagious. In other words, Fracastoro is right. Because as the plague spreads its poison upon the bodies of men, so they infected the minds of such citizens as conversed with them uh, with poisonful and seditious thoughts and, and inclinations. Shall the itch, scab, measles, smallpox, etc., be acknowledged catching and infectious by the experience of every silly woman? And shall the plague be esteemed animal mansu, a harmless and innocent creature? But they easily reject the authorities and reasons of, of physicians and naturians, or so they call them, and reason thus from scriptures. The plague is called the sword, the hand, the arrow of God, and therefore it cometh not by contagion, since neither an hand, a sword, an arrow doth wound by contagion. You just figured out the end of the paper there. Throughout Hamlet, such a material language of pathogenic contagion struggles to account for the character's desire to contain or control the greater threat of the interior, that which, according to Hamlet, has its show. Hamlet resists the horrors of the night, the time of day most associated with contagion in Shakespeare, opting instead for a verbal rather than physical assault on his mother. It is now the very witching time of night when churchyards yawn and hell itself breathes out contagion to this world. Now I could drink hot blood and do such bitter business as the day would quake to look on. Soft, now to my mother. O oh heart, lose not thy nature. Let not ever the soul of Nero enter this firm bosom. Let me be cruel, not unnatural. I will speak daggers to her, but use none. My tongue and soul in this be hypocrites. How in my words, howsoever she be shent, to give them seals never, my soul content, consent. But as Hamlet's words become daggers to Gertrude's ears, the material or immaterial cause of the tainted mind or soul, confused here as in the priest, is the central concern. Hamlet's stated reason for choosing words over force is an attempt to avoid the unnatural act of violence against his mother. But it is the ghost's command to leave her judgment to God that prefigures this decision. The ghost implores Hamlet to stay focused on the unnatural Claudius. Taint not thy mind, nor let thy soul contrive against thy mother off. Ghost's warning. Warning against the tainted mind raises some intriguing questions for the present consideration of contagion. Harris notes that taint was a hybrid word in the Renaissance with two distinct origins, the first deriving from a taint or a tain, which was to reach, touch, or strike, the second from the Latin tinctus, to tint or color. The noun form tinctus is subsequently derived from the verb tingo, which emphasizes the tactile nature of staining through explicit reference to the act of wetting, soaking, or figuratively saturating 
and viewing. Foregrounding the relations among these terms, the exchange between Hamlet and Gertrude in the closet scene increases the ambiguity of the direction of the action. Hamlet's first spoken dagger, his admission that his murder of Polonius is, quote, almost as bad as kill a king and marry with his brother, is his first strike at Gertrude's soul. As his words become daggers, the language clearly moves from material to immaterial contamination. According to Hamlet, Gertrude has committed, quote, such an act that blurs the grace and blush of modesty, calls virtue hypocrite, takes off the rose from the fair forehead of an innocent love, and sets a blister there, makes marriage vows as false as dicers owes, owes such a deed as from the body of contraction plucks the very soul, and sweet religion makes a rhapsody of words, heaven's face doth blow. Yea, this solidity and compound mass with tristful visage as against the doom is thought sick at the act. Thought sickness is intriguing as an example of the tainted mind that Hamlet has been urged to resist himself and now strives to reveal in his mother. But of course the play is not forthcoming about the extent of Gertrude's guilt, the extent to which she has actually committed such an act. Her incredulity in the face of Hamlet's initial accusations when he says, to kill a king, and then, what have I done? She says, her response is, to kill a king, and then she says, what have I done that thou darest wag your tongue in noise, rude noise against me? These reactions suggest that what we are witnessing in the scene is the tainting of Gertrude's mind in response to Hamlet's verbal assault. Certainly she has married Claudius, her husband's brother, to the horror of her mourning son but it's not clear at all that she colluded in her husband's murder. The scene suggests that she needs an external stimulus to spread the contagion of Claudius's iniquity. Only when Hamlet forces her to look on the pictures of the two kings, emphasizing the disconnect between her rational and sensuous faculties, does he begin to reveal or invent her guilt. She says, Thou turnest my very eyes into my soul, and there I see such black and grinned spots as will not leave their taint. Having successfully tainted Gertrude's mind, Hamlet is arrested by the ghost returner and the suggestion that the source of the stain is not internal. The tainted soul revealed to Gertrude by Hamlet as, quote, in a glass where you may see the inmost part of you, may have come from an external cause. Hamlet did set up a glass, but it does not reflect necessarily her inner soul, is something we learn about mirrors in Richard II. Rather, the ghost's injunction to step not between her and her fighting soul rests on the idea that she is not yet lost, uh, not soul-stained in the increases irrevocable sense. The aphorism that the ghost provides, conceit in weakest bodies, strongest works, is actually a repetition of Hamlet's own earlier recognition that in his mourning state, he is weakened and vulnerable to the devil's illusions. For the devil is, and this is Hamlet, very potent with such spirits. The solution, the ghost suggests, is to speak to them. For all the closet seal scene reveals, then, it is what it leaves concealed that matters most. Like all of the play's tantalizing ambiguities, Gertrude's tainted soul eludes the view. The language of contagion, so promising in its ability to make the visible and make visible the invisible, debunk the immaterial, and explain the source of the corruption in the play fails in the end to reveal convincingly the mysteries that drive the action. Tellingly, it is the resolution of the action in the plot of poison cups and swords that brings the play's meditation on material corruption and the tainted mind together in a final, unambiguous, if not satisfying, conclusion. Prompted to revenge by Claudius Laertes reveals his plan to, quote, touch Hamlet with his, quote, contagion. I bought an unction of a mountebank so mortal, uh, but dip a knife in it, where it draws blood, no cataplasm so rare, collected from all simples that have virtue under the moon, can save the thing from death that is but scratch withal. I'll touch my point with this contagion, that if I gall him slightly, it may be death. Laertes' poison, the contagion, though clearly external, is not born on the air and has no power to infect without visible contact. The tip of the foil or the lips to the glass, that's what we need here. He must touch him with the unction for it to work. That the contest, uh, that, uh, the contest is a game of touches, that's 
uh, fittingly completes the rhetorical circle. The ensuing action, defined by a series of hits or strikes, very palpable, according to Osric, whose role is to observe the sport and confirm the contact. It is these hits from the envenomed foil that lead to Hamlet, Laertes, and Claudius' deaths, that poison bodies irrevocably contaminated such that, quote, no medicine in the world can do any good.
effect upon something in it, but they take you in a new direction. So one thing I'm supposed to my grand Japan and also to Carl for organizing this event and all of the data. Now it turns out that arrows figure a little bit in Jim's paper. Uh, drawing on the work of Isabel Plantin, uh, Jim tells us that at the turn of the 17th century, quote, the concept of contagion provided a solution to the problem of natural, in natural philosophy, one's action at a distance. The problem was to explain how contagion could spread from one body to another if the bodies in question never made contact. In fact, historians suppose that invisible material bodies pass from one body to the other, but according to Francis Herring, and tells us some people resisted this idea, arguing that the plague is rightly called the sword, the hand, the arrow of God. Therefore, it comes not by contagion, since neither the hand, the sword, nor the arrow of contagion. In other words, there is special providence in the fall of an arrow. <laughs> God is the cause of punishment, whether his causal agency is conceived as immediate, as the metaphor of and suggests, or need, the metaphor of the arrow. The metaphor of the sword, an instrument held in the hand rather than shot from it, it seems to stand curiously between these extremes to kind of mediate and immediacy. So what interests Jim is the difference between, or one of the things interests Jim is the difference between material contagion and immaterial contagion, and of course the relationship between them. If material contagion takes place through the mediation of bodies, Immaterial contagion takes place in the mediation of thought. And once again, there seems to be a kind of mixed case standing in between these extremes, which I take to be that of the miasmal contagion spread by semi material, semi spiritual atmospheres, which is now very rich in time, night, etc. Maybe even a ghost is of that order. A key feature of thoughts for Shakespeare, especially the thoughts of lovers their ability to instantaneously convey themselves from one place to another. Hamlet gives this idea a temporal as well as a spatial inflection when he bids the ghost to hasten to identify his murderer, that I, the wings of swift as meditation or the thoughts of love, may sweep to my revenge. The ability of thoughts to instantaneously traverse vast distances is contrasted in Shakespeare with the inability of bodies to do the same a complaint made by many a Shakespearean lover. The frustration felt in such cases, in effect, why can't my body be with my beloved when my thoughts can? Not only underscores the fact that bodies cannot communicate at a distance, but also perhaps highlights thoughts' impotence, the fact that mere thoughts cannot act at a distance, even if they can, in a sense, traverse distances. It would be interesting to consider whether the cases of contagious thought that Jim so interestingly discusses all presuppose the material proximity of the bodies whose souls are their bearers. Certainly Hamlet's physical proximity to Gertrude in the closet scene plays a crucial role in his ability to turn her eyes into her very soul, making her see such black and green that spots as well not be really tanked. Cameron's characterization of tearing this plane makes perfect sense. To tarry is to idle, literally to spend time doing nothing. The countryman who says, let the plow play today, and the true noble kinsman knows that he will receive a chiding from his master for um, taking the day off. And Hamlet chides himself for taking so long to kill Claudius. But as Cameron points out, it's precisely by playing that Hamlet reaches his goal, however rounded up his path is to it. Instances of this include the staging of play within the play, his playing with the recorders, and his playing with the areas, as Cameron pointed out. But Hamlet tells the first player that the purpose of playing was and is as as toward to hold the mirror as to, is to hold as toward the mirror up to nature. He reminds the player and us that play has a purpose and so some kind of teleological structure. What Hamlet wrestles with throughout the play is the problem of how to reconcile the teleology of human agency with the teleology of providence. He first poses this problem in stoic terms as the choice between suffering the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune and taking arms against the sea of trouble. If he resolves it, it is an act five when he says to Horatio, there's a divinity that shapes our ends, what human how we will. His resolve to keep playing even when all's ill about his 
part suggest a fundamentally Christian trust that by playing he will ultimately achieve his end. But to play, as he has known throughout, is to act. Hamlet has to shoot arrows, never quite knowing where they will land, as when he stabs Polonius through the arrows. Now, admittedly, he kills Polonius with a rapier rather than with an arrow. But when he later asks Lance for forgiveness, he says, let my disclaimer from a purpose be will free me so far in your generous thoughts that would have shot my arrow or the house and hurt my brother. So kind of side note here, it'd be interesting to compare this speech with Bassanio's speech about arrows in the merchant of Venice. Bassanio explains to Antonio how, as a child, he used to recover arrows that he carelessly shot and lost while playing. In my school days, when I had lost my own chef, I shot his fellow of the self-same flight the self-same way with more advising watch to find the other four. When by adventuring both, I found both. Bassanio urges this childhood proof because he has squandered the money that Antonio has shot his way and would like a second chance. But if you please to shoot another, so that self way that you did shoot the first. I do not doubt as I will watch the aim or to find both, or bring your ladder hazard back again, and thankfully, let's get it for the first. To shoot another arrow that self-way, that self-way is a wonderful phrase, usually glossed that same way, but perhaps echoing Polonius' advice to Polaris, this above all, to my own self, be true. You know, let's follow the night of David Kent, and then be false to any man. Like Bassanio, to Antonio, Hamlet asked Laertes for a second chance. So if he himself shot the first arrow, he invites Laertes to shoot another that self away, an act that will culminate in their mutual slaughter and exchange of forgiveness. Chanon picks up on my comparison of Brandon and Zizek's interpretation of Hegel's conception of determinate negation. Throughout the book, I suggest that Hamlet personifies negation in a way that makes him resemble not Socrates so much as the sophist. What I characterize as the problem of the objective correlative is equivalent to Plato's question about what sort of reality the sophist has or is answerable to. As Chen Lam says, I take hate in trying to develop a conception of the world that does away with the Kantian thing in itself. I'm not sure one needs the thing in itself, however, to save objectivity. My objection to Brandon is not so much that he neglects the metaphysical dimension of Hegel's thought, but that he attributes to Hegel a conception of reality as fully determinate. If reality is fully determinate, then determinate negation can be nothing but the differential structure or texture of the world. That's the view that I characterize in the book as Armandian, as Chandran pointed out, but which I probably should have characterized as Thomas, speaking of the sophist. Chandran raises several important questions that I need to think about more carefully, including um, the pragmatist dimension of Brandon's account and the whole um, mutual recognition between the past and the future, and how that does really point to a certain kind of open emptiness. Uh, another is the idea of um, this idea that I, 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 I try to um, explore between excuse me, the idea of a fully objective but only partially determinate world. Perhaps this idea is ultimately incoherent. In defending the idea, I rely on Kant's distinction between an illicit constitutive principle of thoroughgoing determination, according to which things are fully determined, but according to Kant, could only apply to things as they are in themselves, and a regulative principle of determinability that applies only to temporal appearances. Zizek suggests that he doesn't mention this in Kant, but Hegel simply radicalizes this distinction by eliminating the residual traces of the thing itself. But Chang'an wonders if this leads to the loss of objectivity, some kind of disentitlement to that asymmetric grounding approach. So I suppose I could try to respond to this worry by taking up Cameron's suggestion at the end of his paper that Hamlet plays the thing in itself. Could the thing in itself be something like play? Maybe we could make sense of this idea by characterizing appearances, that is, things as they manifest themselves in time, as having partially determined characteristics that offer a certain amount of play or give, so that their givenness would leave room for further development. 
the idea that things are in a state of becoming, which is really a little random here, that is well expressed, albeit negatively, in Zeno's paradoxes, whose paradox account is less offensive to the German idealists, including how that is the philosophers committed to some version of the principle of thoroughgoing determination. I mentioned it simply to throw out a reference to the paradox of the arrow. <laughs> <laughs> the contagious object that cannot be in motion without being at rest, that cannot be without not being where it is at any given time. So thank you. <laughs>
just I'm wondering if you could say a little more about how you were thinking of the conceptual character aspect throughout the book, and if it's the determinant negation or the negativity, if that was sort of what we were playing the role of, uh, or the, con the key concept we were playing the role of. Yeah, I mean, the thing that really interested me that I was trying to, you know, work through was just what a philosopher has done with Hamlet. And my sense was that um, it wasn't so much that they were writing about Hamlet, that they were using Hamlet as a voice in certain ways, often marginal places, and often not front and center. But very few philosophers in the tradition really developed extended discussions of Hamlet. But he plays crucial roles here and there. And the idea of the conceptual character or conceptual persona in Barclays and Wilson and Um and what I had such a massive material and I had no idea of how to organize things, uh, except that I was working with, with uh, Russell Neustadt on his dissertation on um, the con history of the concept of negation. And at a certain point, I realized that uh, actually Hamlet personifies negation in a number of different ways. And uh, so that led to my comparison of Hamlet to the sophists and to think about. Uh, certain modern types of negation, like um, problems like uh, uh, nihilism, uh, non-existence, fictional objects that we seem to be able to refer to, the thing that critics call the language, we try to refer to Qualtarian, etc. And so, um, so uh, the fiction of the book is that there is a kind of unified critical perception found in modern philosophy, and that it is Hamlet the other figure that we can say that he personifies it. Not to bring you back to the work and play uh, um, dichotomy, but it makes me think of Shakespeare, but it makes me think of the, um, the chorus on the play goers uh, to work their thoughts to, to see a scene. And then one has to uh, um, think about the um, whether, to what extent, play going is an act of leisure play or uh, uh, an act of, um, of work. Like as much work as to put on the performance. Um, but I, want, I actually wanted to uh, ask a question about um, uh, Shakespeare's trip, um, Hamlet's trip to England. And uh, it's said, or it has been said, that um, the decision, or there's some kind of change that's made in his absence, or in his absence from the stage. And to what extent maybe that has to do with the. Um, a quality of negativity in, in, in which this may, um, perhaps the, the, the crux of the play is happens not on the stage but somewhere else. It's an interesting idea. I have to think about that more. I mean, one of the things that comes to mind is uh, Rosalind Prince and Gilbert's turn to dead, you know, and, uh, and the way that that's kind of the, the negative of Hamlet or a possible negative of Hamlet to play in a certain way. So I think. It, Part of it is that um, if, if there is some way in which Hamlet um, sort of is a um, force of negativity in the play, uh, that there might be some way in which it's, uh, to speak in a very Hegelian way, the negation of that negation that does a certain work while he's uh, not present. And everybody tells us about Is that right? Not for me to say, but I, I, I just think about how the, the body is absent. The, the so the, the thoughts are, you know, transferred from somewhere else, and the, the action is absent. And yet, this is a major. Uh, uh, people say that it's a moment of transition in the play. Yeah, yeah, and I never know what to do with that whole question about, you know, is there, and you brought this up too, you dealt with this, you might want to respond about, is there some kind of dramatic sea change uh, at, you know, during the sea battle or after the sea battle? Um, yeah, I've never quite heard you know what to do with that question. Well, I mean, the thing that strikes me about that moment, uh, and I, I mean, I have to go back and look to be sure, but it seems like in um, in discovering the letter that Rosemary Gilson are carrying, that I think is the first literal evidence that Hamlet has that that is not from the ghost. 
that Claudius is a murderer. And, and in fact, he tends to murder him, or have him murdered. And so that strikes me as a, a re resolution of something that to him would have been ambiguous through the whole play. And that's a kind of a sea change in my, in my mind. And, and, but then when he comes back, he does not storm on like Laertes does. When Laertes has that, has that as he actually takes action. So I'm, I'm always sort of, uh, there's, a, there's a delay there. Even, and I think a part of the point of that delay may be to show that Hamlet is not just delaying because he doesn't have proof. He's delaying because he's a delayer or, or a character. <laughs> but I, I think there's something in that, um, in that discovery that, um, that is a change. I like that idea. It'd be interesting to compare what's going on with that letter um, with the letter that Polonius stretched to the king and queen and it's written to Cordelia <coughs> and whether there's some kind of a difference there. But I'm thinking also how this your reading might play into what Jim was saying about how we pass from um, a, a form of contagion that's a little bit more nebulous, let's say, to, um, to this uh, more tactile, material form of um, interaction of bodies and but a tangible evidence that Hamlet gets there, um, crucially involved in writing in a certain way, might play into that. that yeah. So Mike, and then in the back. Um, thank you. Uh, yeah, I wanted to ask about the third paper, uh, the theme of contagion. And I kind of uh, uh, listened to that as immediately in the next week, pollution and Texas Rex. And I was wondering if there were, um, so in, in Texas Rex is a, a pollution that's uh, uh, contaminated the state and um, you have a, another scene uh, or parallel with a, a king that's in place that came to power through some false meat or, or some nefarious meat. And the, 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 the play resolves itself with uh, Edith's blinding himself on the truth. Um, so what I wanted to ask was, is there any sort of uh, vision-centric or ocular-centric kind of themes that you can read at the end of Hamlet that might complete that sort of book and sort of parallel there? Um, or is it sort of I get my, my quick response would be that I think it's, it's different than Hamlet, which, which is surprising because I think usually there's an author of being in Shakespeare <laughs> written a book about it. And so, um, yeah, King Lear is, is the play that I would look for, for that kind of narrative about a uh, relationship between sort of seeing and not seeing, uh, being illuminated in blindness. And literally, the character Foster is often talked about that way when he's, he's blind is when he sees the truth. So you get a, yeah, Shakespeare was able to, to represent that <laughs> that moment, that very moment on stage. But in, in Hamlet, uh, I, I think it, it's, it's oddly that there's a, there's a there is, I think, a, a thematic emphasis on the relationship between the visible and the invisible. Um, but it's it's more subtle, and I think it rests on at least what I'm starting to think of more on this part. It rests more on, on touch than it does on, on vision, um, and it touches. Touches an interesting uh, sensation about it. It, it, it involves proximity, which would actually uh, sort of go to Mark's point, which is once you remove characters, once you, once you remove them from the ability to literally be next to each other, the, the situation becomes different, the possibilities are different. Um, and it's not, a, I don't think it's an accident that the resolution of the play ends up with everybody in close proximity leading to their deaths. <laughs> that's, that's what actually the, So in one sense, yeah, I mean, you, see, you see that, for sure. Um, but it's weird in that at the end of Othello, Lodovica says, you know, look at the tragic loading of this bed, the object poisons sight. You know, it's all about the visual, and that plays a little bit of visual references. In there, very much the same. You know, that, very much about vision. Cameron, a little, little less. And you know, you, you get the, you know, from the Hecuba speech, the, the talk, that's a nice thing. That's a that's a something else. It doesn't say like how can you do it? They're looking. Maybe the Polonians can't quite watch. Maybe that's visual, but you get the sense that it's something about their actual proximity that's that's changing them and <laughs> making them 
taking up time that I'll get that. So I'll have that answer to your question. It's a good question. I could almost, I mean, I almost want to say something like, they can tend to be power to make things close that are, that are far away. Um, so you, you can you know, see things on the horizon that are, that are, that remain far away in some sort of measurable kind of way, but still they, they can be an object of interest that, uh, that, that sort of orients, orients your behavior in. Oh, these are just as sort of impactful as if you're touching. Sure, I mean, the, the, that way, I was thinking you're more talking about the, the fact that there needs to be a sort of blinding in order to get insight. Um, but, but if your question is more just about generally, uh, I mean, yeah, like the Hamlet, you know, is desperate to see proof. So he could set up the mousetrap to get visual proof. He, he watches uh, as, as uh, Claudia or Fuzz crazy. He doesn't listen, unfortunately, because if he, if he was listening, he'd get like the, the, you know, the really nice <laughs> you know, um, uh, confession there. But then he sees what and says, how can this person be you know, doing this, fighting over this tiny patch of nothing? You know, that's it. So yeah, in that way, all of these things are brought to into proximity. But it seems to me what he sees, he sees more clearly, uh, you know, rather than seeing less clearly. Uh, it's not that he's not aware. Whereas Oedipus, you know, for example, keeps on being presented with exactly what he should see and doesn't see it. You know, gee, I, I'm trying to avoid killing my father. And, there's this old guy on the, on the road that I don't know. I think I'll kill him. You know, you sort of think, ah, what are you trying to avoid? You don't, you know, and you know, he continues. So sort of, I guess I think the dynamics of fiction are different from the two plays, uh, which might be why they're interrelated. I mean, I'm not saying that there's not a, a reason to read them against each other, but it just seems like a mistake. Yeah, I, I think that going back to what Andy said about not knowing what to do with the, the sea change issue, and, and I, I feel exactly the same way. One of the things other than, than having seen the letter uh, that happens is a lot of things happen that, that strike Hamlet as random, right? That, that there are things that are out of his control. And and it's in this, it, your, your paper touched on this, that it somehow, in whatever way, I'm not sure how to understand it, it's his um, slightly lessened sense that he needs to urgently act that makes it possible for him to act, which is again kind of an example of the negation that you're talking about, where it's just, it, it doesn't, it seems as though he, he should be more urgent, but it's when he becomes less urgent that he actually is capable of the action. Um, I, I wanted to ask Jim a question about, um, when you're talking about temptation, I really like the way you do wrap things up with Hamlet and Touch and Malcolm at the end, neatly packaged it. Um, but when you were talking about contagion, you were talking about contagion and especially relating it to the air. And yet, in the course of your examples, a lot of them were liquid, right? A lot, and, and, and one of the things that seems to me that's happening there is that there's kind of a, uh, you have these elements that are supposed to be distinct somehow, but but in the, in the example of contagion, it seems like the, the separability of the liquid from the air becomes really a problem. Um, and, it, and it gets to the whole, I, I guess one, one part of that question is um, maybe what, what understanding um, people were developing on the notion of permeability. Time, which is, is, is the example for Pernod gets into that, right? The question how can something mediate between two opposite you know, things? But, so that, that, but, but it, it seems all, your examples were, were that, that weird English metaphor of liquid sky, you yeah. know. Um, all of them had, a lot of them had that connected to contagion, titanius, et cetera. Yeah, and that, that hits it right on the head. I think that the, the key might be going back to the Martin Barb you know. <laughs> uh, so I, the, the paradox that they, that they were trying to, all this stuff is really confused in the theory. That's what I find so interesting about it. It's, it's not, it, you want to say, well, what was the theory of, you know, air? What was the theory? And, and, and they're not, they're not consistent. They're, they're, they're sort of obviously inconsistent. Um, in one sense, air is, is material. And that's, so that's one answer, is that there is this sense of even something like air is material. But, in all of the accounts, and I just you know, use it for now here, but there's, they're all throughout these medical and also treatises on natural philosophy. There's there's a sense that there's a gradation, and you move from you know really solid to to liquid to 
to that, but it's described in terms of thinness. And the term rarefied almost always is used. And so it's thinner and thinner and thinner and thinner and thinner. At some point, it's so thin that it can contact the soul. And it can share of, these are the kind of ways that put it, it can have a share in the soul or be a, be a part of it. So the problem is that that's where they get really vague. <laughs> at that point. So you can hear them saying the idea of a contagious fog is okay, partly because it may have particles in it that they can sort of either conceive in a recreation sense, an atomistic sense of little stuff in there that's maybe vapor, vaporized water. It wasn't that that was unrealized. But they really, I think, all of the people who were thinking this through were, were trying to allow for there to be a continuum that went all the way to the immaterial, which ultimately was not possible, right? Ultimately, it just was not sensible. So that's what they kind of run up against. And so the project, because you're absolutely right, you point out the project that I think is interesting in the literature, in the book Shakespeare, is I think they're exploiting that. They're exploiting the, that ambiguity at the crossover between the moment when we can all say, yes, it's dangerous to go down near the Thames when everybody's been dumping their waste in it because there might be stuff in the air, right? And, you know, angels or something, which are different. Uh, souls are called immaterial substances in the most impressive you know, sort of rhetorical attempt to allow for both to operate. So I don't have an answer for you, but basically I'm, I'm saying the question is the right question. <laughs> it, it's, it's really interesting stuff. So we first have a question. Yeah, uh, this is a, an ill-formed thought, but since uh, we've got four experts here, I thought I'd uh, throw it out. Uh, this idea of play, I never thought of, of Shakespeare and the idea that the play should go on and on because it's a play and that it should continue on. And the thing that, that struck me is we're having such difficulty in our society today figure out, figuring out what play is. And we've really distorted it in so many ways. You had a footnote for the NFL, as an example. And uh, so I, I wonder if, if there's some way that this notion of confronting negativity in an easier way or in a more more visible way, or more tangible way, uh, is really another another gift of looking at Hamlet this way, as a play. I don't know if that's triggered any thoughts. Oh, well, this, this sounds very much like Corbin's question as well, I, I think. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's interesting to me just that this, this uh, question of temporality in the play is because the play for Hamlet, it seems like there's a very real possibility that it could just go on forever, or that he could, you know, leave leave Denmark and just not choose not to interact with Claudius anymore, or leave the court. Um, there's one uh, Kent. This is another Bloom observation, or I can't remember if it was Bloom or somebody else said it, but one one uh, critic was like, well. You know, can't, can't we imagine Hamlet going off to England and aging into Falstaff or something like that? <laughs> <laughs> and that's a, I mean, it's, it's a possibility. But, but yet, the, I mean, in order to present a character like Hamlet who could feel something like that, you have to still end the play so it's something that can be witnessed by an audience. Um, so you still need that sort of finite temporality in which to portray a character like that. But, uh, but then, that, that doesn't really go to your question. Really. No, because it, then it's, it's this issue of developments. We, we keep looking for, we have work and we have play. And we keep saying, well, yeah, but can play, you know, that, play with that idea. And the thing that struck me is, is if there, there's character development through the play, mm -hmm. I guess is another way to yeah. put a question out of that. I wonder if the distinction between work and play in the Renaissance would, would have been as, as clear. If that's the yeah. I don't know if we want to think about it historically, but I definitely uh, leisure in Renaissance England, for sure, was not a, not a high priority thing. <laughs> and it was a, being, you know, being a, you know, uh, basically a, somebody messed around to do stuff. Right. Uh, the, the invitation to not not work was was, not, was, was usually considered a threat from mm -hmm. the one of the devil. Right? <laughs> um, so, I don't know. I mean, I think that can I ask a related question to the play for the Terrian question? Because it seems like that's another way to think about Terrian. When in Merchant of Venice, for example, you know, when uh, Portia asks Shylock to, to tear a little, she's asking him to work a little harder, isn't she? Well, so the way that I want to read that is that um, 
she's, uh, you know, he's in there in the name of the law, right? And he just wants this rigorous kind of justice that doesn't allow for any leniency whatsoever or forgiveness, etc. And um, when she says Terry, um, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a crux for my reading because I'm suggesting that delay is associated with the law and tearing is outside the law. So for the law to say tarry um, uh, is kind of um, paradoxical from my point of view. So what I think she's doing is she's pretending to speak in the name of the law. What? Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, Sarah. Yeah. Well, right, but, but, but still, I guess the, the, the thing I'm asking about is he's rather not Portia as much as what it means for him. What is she asking him to do? I mean, is she asking him to to do something that's not doesn't have a end, or is she asking him to really think about what he's doing, which would be rather than delaying the sense of the legal, which can make the situation. Yeah, because you know, I recall she um, when she's first trying to get him to show forgiveness or. Um, um, to forgive. Um, she doesn't use the word carry then. It's only after Shylock has reached the point of no return. He's not going to give in. And then it's carried to, um, you know, the laws and the claim on you and all of that. Um, so at that point, I don't, I don't take it to be invitation to any longer. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, I'm going to go back to seeing and not seeing what I want to add a, another dimension. Uh, to the conversation about the play, which was written to be performed. And um, I may not have the details of the play under complete control, but there's a scene in, there's a Canadian series called Slings and Arrows, and there's a rehearsal scene where the director is finally taking his actor, his Hamlet, aside and says, now you've got to get serious about this. And the way in which he does it is this. He said, you have to decide, you have to decide whether Hamlet is aware that Polonius and Claudius overhear the to be or not to be uh, soliloquy. And you have to decide it now. Now, I think Granville Barker, when he's writing a critique of, of Hamlet in terms of performance, has a similar point that he makes, I don't know whether it's right there in the play or another place in the play, but it's left up to the director and the actor for to communicate to the audience that Hamlet suddenly remembers something that clicks in, and somehow the kind of conspiracy angle begins to, to come into his consciousness. And in the, in the movie, in the Russian movie of Hamlet, they do that beautifully by bringing in a piece of, of staircase that somehow is associated with that former scene. And you see him do this, and suddenly that connection is made. Now, there are several questions that I think are interesting there. The playwright writes the play and leaves certain very essential things about that play up to the discretion of the way in which the artwork is completed by other artists, namely the actor and the director. Uh, that's one angle that I think is, is very interesting. And it seems to me, Andrew, this feeds into you, the whole issue of the randomness. You know, uh, and the other one, which is my pet peeve, is somehow this one is a better production because he shows you for sure that Hamlet is a little crazy. Or he shows you for sure that he's not. And I think Shakespeare wrote it, you're not supposed to know whether he's crazy or not. And so um, I, thought, I think the performance angle, I think, needs to, to come into the conversation uh, about the way in which negativity operates uh, when a playwright is writing for performance. Yeah, that makes sense to me. And um, one of the things I want to pick up on here that I'm really excited about what you're saying is uh, it connects for me two issues that I hadn't been able to connect before. One is um, this idea about, you know, thinking of things as being only partially determined. And on the other hand, um, thinking about Hamlet as a kind of exemplary case of 
a non-existent object, a fictional object. I have a whole chapter on Bertrand Russell, of all people, and much to my disappointment, there have been several reviews of this book, but nobody mentions that I do anything with Russell. And uh, I think it's going to remain in just a long blind spot because no one thinks of Russell as an insightful reader, I think, of Shakespeare, but he, he really was. And one of the things that, uh, of course, Russell works about a lot is you know, the status of fictional objects. And um, Adam is one of his prime examples that he keeps coming back to. And um, one of the standard arguments that's given for why fictional objects can't be real is that they're not fully determined. And um, so, what you're making me realize here, that, that's kind of grist for my mill here, in a certain way, because I think what you're saying about the is exactly right. Yeah. Can I add just one, one thing to that? It, it seems also that the play is, in an interesting way, over-determined in the sense that it's too long to be staged uncut. Uh, or maybe, maybe it's not too long, but it's very nearly too long to be staged uncut without you know, filming it or presenting it some other way besides being simply an audience in a theater. Uh, and so part of the, exactly part of the creative decisions that the actors and the directors have to make is what part of this play are we going to omit? And yeah, and so I just wanted to add that, add that as another sort of wrinkle to this over-determined, under-determined. I just add as a, as a textual studies person that I actually think there is an object and it's the text. Um, and so even though you can say that Hamlet doesn't exist, the Hamlet that emerges in performance is always determined by the text. And that scene, the reason why the scene you talk about is important that directors have to make a, a choice is there's the line, where's your father? As soon as Hamlet says, where's your father? We know that there's a shift in that particular scene. And that why is he asking that question at that moment? Shakespeare was absolutely brilliant about embedding stage direction. And one of the, really the, the sort of, I think, most convincing arguments when you look at the Shakespearean text now about uh, Shakespeare, especially compared to his, his uh, contemporaries, is that he actually was not one who liked to leave a lot up to the director. He was part of the company that, that put, put these plays on for one thing. He wasn't particularly comfortable, and that's why the texts are so filled with embedded stage directions, so that uh, things like you know, a character coming up to another character saying, well, the look in your face tells me that I'm no longer in your favor. Well, if you have a director, you can do that just through facial expression. Shakespeare's making it clear that he wants you to know exactly how that scene is going to happen. And so while there are certainly places where there's all these decisions that are made, there's also lots of places that are determined by the text. So I would agree that there's a, there's a in some ways, the, the text of Hamlet poses problems for exactly that reason. Unless you do really big things. For example, I don't know if you've heard that the Barbican is doing a Hamlet with Benedict Cumberbatch, which is called Sherlock fame, which has driven the world crazy. Uh, and they start the play with uh, the to be or not to be speech. The to be or not to be speech is the first speech uttered in the play as the lights go up, not who's there. So, yeah, if you do that, absolutely. But if you follow the text, and, you believe, and it's impossible to follow, if you get that right, if you can't follow the play text, the whole way it's probably unperformable. But there are shorter versions that existed in the you know, 17th century. Well, you know, I have two things to say about that part. Haaret talks about language. And when she talks about drama, one of the things she distinguishes between the way in which the past biographies uh, turn into real things by being written down, and then they go dead. And drama is the only thing that brings them back to life. <laughs> So if you, if you are so completely subservient to the text, you lose that. I think that's one of the things you have to take into account. The other thing is, uh, I'm going to switch to Lear now. There is a scene in Lear when Lear has just come back from the hunt. And he comes in and he orders the servant to bring them uh, food and drink and stuff like that. And in the modern editions, there's added in, exit servant, but that's not in the Tony And the abs and a friend of mine wrote an article on this. The play requires that the servant not leave. And that's justified by some of the comments made later in the in that same scene where they say, I notice not so much respect being given 
as you are wont to have. So uh, I think you have to be careful about exactly where did that stage direction come from. Uh, yeah, I wasn't saying be, be I wasn't saying be truthful to a later editorial intervention. No, I'm, I'm saying, saying I'm saying what we have in Shakespeare's text tell us something about what he expected. No, we're talking about negativity. The absence of a direction that you leave becomes important in the play. That's what I'm I just can't help but um, Sam Beckett's lawyers seem to be Blood for example, in the sense that they earn their money because he's well known to sue people for not performing the place as he intended or his stage directions are so uh, specific. But it, I, I feel more sympathetic to that after listening to part of this conversation because what I think Beckett, not to draw that whole issue, with this, but what he was trying to do, I think, for his sense of his own work was so specific and, and so broad and, and, and attached to the negative that he wanted people to pay attention to what he was going for and didn't want to distract a further interpretation later, or maybe he was controlled later, but I, I, I'm more sympathetic. Yeah. So, just to interject, some of this is making me think, uh, coming back to uh, Kim Nam and also uh, uh, Andrew, your discussion of the conceptual persona, I just keep thinking about this, but uh, sort of how things stand with philosophy, where if drama is the thing that provides the text, uh, you could say that the conceptual donning the conceptual persona kind of revives the text for philosophy as well, uh, depending on what sort of concept you're going to find or concepts you find in the text. Um, but I'm just thinking with Kyungnam that determining a concept over time, it sort of gets really messy because uh, I'm saying you don't you definitely don't have stage directions there to tell you what to do or which way to go. Uh, in order to follow a train of thought coherently. Uh, or if you, I suppose you can see that as sort of a logical apparatus or something that works alongside. But I'm just wondering if any of the discussion about the performative aspect of play, of a, a play or a drama, maps on in your mind to uh, how we do philosophy as well. Um, I don't know much about Shakespeare, and I said it was kind of hard to <laughs> participate in. This uh, sophisticated <laughs> uh, literature discussion. Uh, but I think uh, we can think of two aspects of negativity in terms of uh, the play in our lives <laughs> in general. And the first negativity could be accounted for in terms of uh, our decisions. We uh, decide our roles by denying some other roles. So I decide uh, by I decide to be a student uh, by denying uh, to by denying to be uh, a buyer, <laughs> something like that. So that kind of negativity uh, operates in terms of the, the decision of the role of myself. But the, I think we can think of the more fundamental negativity. Uh, terms of uh, our lives and play as well. Uh, the fundamental negativity that we can find is that it is impossible to determine any role regarding any characteristics or any characteristic of uh, either play or uh, our supposed roles in our lives. So sometimes it is impossible to simply uh, say that this is the one it is supposed to be. So, well, in that say, in that aspect, I was thinking that maybe we can think of the laying, uh, the laying, a characteristic of uh, Hamlet in terms of his impossibility to determine what he's supposed to roll is in that uh, play and in his life. So, the conceptual aspect uh, of negativity. roles by denying some other roles, by distinguishing uh, our roles from others. But uh, the fundamental negativity comes uh, when you think of that, of the fact that there might be some aspects that we cannot conceptually articulate. So that's 
fundamental uh, anxiousness, anxiousness that we cannot explain uh, in terms of conceptual languages or theoretical models. Yeah, as you brought up earlier, Carlo, that's, that's especially important for philosophers who want to eke out their exact position and say, no, I'm a hard determinist, not a, not a soft determinist. Just make a comment in regards to Brandon in relation to your question. And it seems like the normativity of meaning and of inferences that, that when I use a concept that permits certain inferences and forbids others, but it's something that only um, takes shape as the practices that we in which we use those concepts, and that's something that can change over time. So the negativity uh, isn't determined for all time or just one concept, but rather like using a word. Uh, could engage different practices and can use different different practices and therefore have different permissions and different um, preventions related to it. And, and so I don't know, like, just like we can't determine necessarily our role in our lives, maybe uh, particular uses of words have some determinacy, but that doesn't establish that practices have to continue in this way. A transformation of the practice could lead to a transformation of the concept or vice versa. After that, and I think that's a really nice because that's that's a reason why we can still be literature because <laughs> you have a, a fixed point and, and, and endless variability. Right? So that you know, this idea of you know, didn't want to be you know, misrepresent my position on the the determinacy of the text. I don't want to suggest that there's one kind of reading you can get from my text, but I do suggest that there is a limited organization of the words on the page. And so the, what you're getting at, and I think all these. Uh, comments are, are really perfect about um, is, is that we are drawn to sometimes this kind of literary text because it allows us to rehearse our own experience. It's much less satisfying <laughs> when you're not dealing with a literary text because you're, it's, it's, the ground is always shifting in your own life as you are work, working towards your own subject formation or your own identity or your, your sense of self. You have to revise and you know, continually return to those concepts that you want to put into action. But when the, there's something that's not moving, Hamlet's always going to die, right? Uh, you know, he's, he's always going to kill Polonius. He's all, all those things are, are consistently there, and so you can kind of return. But so why is it so rich if those things always happen? Yeah. It seems like that's what you're doing. And I take it part of your point is that it's the same, exact same for the history of philosophy as it is for the history of literature, and that you will bring that out trying on my work. Explicating Brandon's account of how we're in fact in some kind of relation of mutual recognition with uh, these conceptual personae we call Descartes, Plato, Kant, etc. And I really like uh, the title of the book. I think the title uh, <laughs> captures uh, the uh, problems of the question here for asking for. So we can struggle and struggle to find the ultimate answer about fundamental ground of our actions and judgments that it might turn out to be working. <laughs> that we can actually <laughs> determine and address it. But we have but we have no choice to but we, we don't have to we don't have any other choice but keep going. Keep going. I really liked I really appreciated the time of us. <laughs> I stole it, I guess what <laughs> <laughs>